Holy smokes, what a life! Not the master, not the war chief, not the master of the land, or even the leader, but the monk. The first monk. The nun. Mortimus. The expanded works on this guy are insane. It's like the realm of fiction in all its fan-driven glory is reaching back to 1965 and saying, nope. Look, if you're gonna have another person from the Doctor's race meddling with history in another TARDIS, then you better come strapped. This is a big thing you're putting out to the world here, especially after the Master's debut. This could easily have been lost in the murk of TV just starting out, with later more refined ideas of what an evil Time Lord should be laying this one firmly to rest. But no. The Monk's history is peppered all across time and space in multiple works of audio and written format old and new, which take place before and after the event of this beloved William Hartnell adventure. A lot to sink your gnashes into if you like this character, this mischievous, playful sort of renegade, doesn't really want to rule or conquer per se, just wants to change past events in a manner that suits him. I'm very much interested in the Monk's expanded timeline, and on looking into it in a bit more detail, I found a great video made by Doctor Who YouTuber and model making enthusiast Captain Jimmy Pie, presented by other Doctor Who YouTuber Josh Snares. It tells the full story of the Monk start to finish in chronological order, and covers every published piece of work relating to that character along the way. It's a masterclass bit of work to be fair, so I put the link in the description so you can check it out after watching this. Chosen Chimp here. It all started in the Time Meddler, which I want to cover because A, Chimp will Chimp, and B, it's a brilliant serial. Sort of dark, sort of surreal, dashings of humour, lots of juicy plot points. The final serial of season 2 of Doctor Who ended on an absolute banger as far as I'm concerned, so I'm going to take the deep dive, I just can't not. The story begins with a sad Doctor and Vicky. What with the two of them two down on their companion roster, Barbara and Ian jumped ship at the end of the chase and farted around with pigeons and buses in their own time, being all normal and stuff. Ah well, two seasons isn't a bad run. Luckily there's a cheeky little Stephen Stowaway in the TARDIS, played by Sir Peter of Peter. He hopped into the TARDIS during the battle between the Daleks and the Mechanoids in the chase, and here we are, a new companion. Hooray! I like Stephen, but the catch-up game is pretty exhausting. It's not until the third episode of this serial that he finally concedes to the idea that they may have actually travelled into the past, and his mockery of the TARDIS with his I don't believe you acronym is... Well, petty, and I'll leave it at that. The TARDIS lands in Saxon Northumbria in the year 1006 plus 6, and straight away this serial fills me with joy. Look at that shot of the monk. Black and white Doctor Who just looked gorgeous on occasions. This is in fact the first in a long list of really cool shots. 10 out of 10 for atmosphere on this one, and they often seem to catch the weather conditions just right. Look at those clouds. The Doctor's sarcasm switch is set to 11 when they find this Viking helmet. A space helmet for a cow, really. He strives to find ways to prove to Stephen that they have travelled back to the ballpark time of the 11th century, and just take a look at this mischievous fellow listening in. Tides, night time, feet, mysterious dwellings, the distant songs of monks chiming across the land from a mysterious monastery. If Doctor Who was like this all the time, I'd probably actually be pretty happy. A fork to the neck. Well, actually, the fork to the neck was a bit of a misunderstanding. See, this is more like it. A big horn of mead. Makes me really want to visit this time period. The Doctor becomes well acquainted with Edith and her community of Saxons. The Doctor clocks that the well-documented Viking invasion is just around the corner. But what's this? The distant singing of monks suddenly goes all wobbly. Well, that's historically inaccurate. Go on, Doc. Off your trot to the monastery. There's your problem. Wait a minute. Look, I know that when you're living in the 21st century that events from the past can get a little bit muddled in the timeline, so I took the liberty of putting in the research on your behalf, and I can confirm that a gramophone is historically out of place in an 11th century monastery. It's not funny, Doctor. There you go, that's how you laugh in someone's face. The meddling monk has decked his holy dwellings out with all kinds of gizmos. There's a toaster, don't burn it, a shiny pan, some good utensils, 
a little tea set there. You know, I think the doctor is bang out of order there. That was clearly a nice breakfast. It makes me kind of glad that we don't see him for an entire rep. Yeah, enjoy your holiday, Hartnell. I'd like to see you get a breakfast of that caliber where you're going, mate. And there he is holding some binoculars. I like to think they're of the high-tech futuristic variety. He's also got whatever that is, some nasal thing, and you later see him with a modern first aid kit containing penicillin, which he masquerades as a sort of herb. Yeah, this guy is definitely up to no good. He's having a whale of a time deceiving the locals, confusing them no less so than when he says good morning at the end of a conversation. Vicky and Stephen are driving the narrative for the time being, with Stephen still struggling to grasp that they are in the past. He's being a very good Ian. When the monk sends the companions off the scent of finding the doctor, so begins a long strand of trickery and deception and double bluffing. Just sneak around the back or something. Vikings, here we go. Look at this weirdo on the hill. An eccentric rabble of savages. You tell me if they're authentic or not. All I can say is that this guy looks badass. When they invade the Saxon village, they kill Edith. They've killed her. Look at her there, lying with her eyes open and that hole in her head, in the arms of her sobbing husband. Rest her poor soul. Young Beard, yeah, let's just call him that, immediately suspects that the Doctor's companions are the murderers, as people in the past always did when time travellers turned up, as the real attackers make their escape in the forest, drinking on the job. Hang on, she's not even dead! Well, that brought about more drama than was actually necessary. She says it was the Vikings that did this, so good job she didn't die. That saved us a lot of hassle. It's war! Hard to keep track of who's who with all that hair and grunting and beards. I don't know if he's squeezing these two people or if they're running their swords through him. Extremely violent stuff. Nobody has a good time of it. I'm glad I wasn't there in person. Anyway, the monk. What else has he got going on here? Stephen and Vicky breach the castle and, oh boy, battle of wits. We'll see about that. Secret passage there, a few vines, and they're back outside. Well, if it isn't Mr. Your Breakfast isn't good enough for me. As pivotal historical events unfold around him, the Doctor realizes that the record player owning holy man being here at this point in time cannot be a coincidence as for the monk the poor guy just can't catch a break first this injured silly sausage stops over at the monastery and now these two vikings have ideas above their longboat it barely gives the monk enough time to work on this highly sophisticated meddling monk progress chart look at the tech there okay let's see arrival in northumbria check position atomic cannon check Sight Vikings, and that's where we're at. We still got Light Beacon Fires, Destroy Viking Fleet, Norman Landing, Battle of Hastings to go. And at the bottom, Meet King Harold. Cool. A lot of planning going on the surface of this sarcophagus here, though it's the sarcophagus itself we're more interested in, am I right? So we get the foreshadowed battle of wits, the doctor poking a stick at the monk's back pretending it's a gun. Through a series of light-hearted conversations, the monk flips the table by coercing the doctor into dressing up as a monk himself, so one all I guess. Here come the Vikings, the bane of this particular linear narrative. This one takes a plank of wood to the head with a ferocity that, quite frankly, actors are probably banned from using right now. That looked really brutal. And look at that one. If you ever wondered who would win in a fight between Time Lords and Vikings, well, here's your answer. Let's just pause a sec. You see, there are two ways that you can look at this episode. You can canonize the trousers off it and implement all the later mythology put upon the monk and the doctor, or you can view this as what it was originally intended to be. Here's the doctor. He's a time traveling old man, not of this world, and the monk is also a time traveling man, not of this world. It's an absolute blast watching Hartnell and Peter Butterworth working together, showing the same kind of chemistry that was seen later with John. Pertwee and Roger Delgado. The clash of morals, even on face value with full disregard to Gallifrey and Time Lord lore, none of which is written into Doctor Who for a very long time to come, is great to watch, with the Doctor stating the golden rule of time and space travelling which is never interfere with the course of history, and the monk being like, says who. It's fun, and you can make things happen ahead of their time. The Doctor almost respects the brazen abandonment of time-travelling principles, if only it didn't make him white-hot angry. However you look at this, these characters work so well together. Arguably even more so when he shows him his own version of the TARDIS. It's like a Men or Motors program, or whatever they call those programs when it's men chatting about cars, I don't know. They're teasing each other about their spaceships like they're making your mum jokes at each other and chuckling like a 
a pair of kids at the end of it. You know, the Doctor seems genuinely happy to be around this guy, if not for the fact that he's morally opposed to his meddling of time. It's just really entertaining. Speaking of canon, this must be the Atomic Canon. The monk is trying to change history by blowing the Vikings up in their boat with atomic weapons, thus extending the reign of Harald, and also allowing King Goodwinsome himself to retain the resources needed to defeat William the Conqueror. Reasons he'd make a good king, apparently, said the monk. Vicky and Stephen reach the eye of the storm, the sarcophagus, and boom, what a bombshell. I kind of wish I was there when this was originally televised. Look at his collection, he's got loads of swag. A neutron bomb, flipping heck. According to his journal, he was the one to tell Leonardo da Vinci about the principles of flight, and as he later confesses to the Doctor, he aided in the construction of Stonehenge with an anti-gravitation lift. The damage is done, folks, he's been here, done that. He just wants to improve things. Jet airlines by 1830 and the likes. But on this occasion, the monk is thwarted, primarily by a lot of rowdy disruption and Benny Hill style chase scenes. He never gets to fire his atomic cannon, and the doctor outwits the monk like the chuckly old child that he is, by tinkering with his TARDIS and leaving him a note saying he's stranded him in time. He's pulled this thing out, I wonder what that does. The Doctor celebrates their clean exit and preservation of history, and there's your happy ending, folks. Some spacey end credits for our viewing pleasure. Looks like a weird sort of Queen video. As for the monk, so that's what the Doctor pulled out. He's botched the TARDIS. The TARDIS is now the same size on the inside as it is on the outside. And it's the opposite to when that Trenzalore thing happened. This time it matches the exterior dimensions, which has made it really small and crap. It's like when the Simpsons characters try to rebuild Ned Flanders' house. You'd think this would leave the monk stranded for good, but no. The monk does indeed escape and undergoes all kinds of mischief in the Daleks' master plan, which is a different story and one that unfortunately no longer exists in its original format, save for selected snippets. After that, it's bye-bye monk in TV land forever, which is kind of sad. What a character. Peter Butterworth, amazing. Love this guy. Good job for preserving this character of a media. Whether you drink in these written works and audiobooks or not, it doesn't take anything away from how good the Time Meddler is as a standalone serial. A true gem. I love it. What other Doctor Who stuff would you like me to talk about? Sound off in the comments and don't forget to hit subscribe. Have a good one.